A Lot You Got to Holler by Nelson Algren out of his short stories, The Neon Wilderness. I think I started stealing right after the old man threw Aunt out of the house. I was about eight and used to look forward to her visit all week. She would dangle me on her knee, kiss me, and give me small coins, pennies and nickels and dimes. I remember her smell, the leather touch of her purse, and the warm touch of her hand when she pressed the coins into my hand. That smell, that purse, those kisses, and those coins were all something that belonged peculiarly to her, as she belonged peculiarly to me, for I never received, nor ever expected, these things from anyone else. The last time I heard her voice was in the hallway, and sensed that she was pleading to kiss me good night, but the old man was in a high-wheeled huff and made her leave without saying goodbye. Years later, I learned she didn't even have a place to stay that night. It must have been the next morning that I saw a neighbor woman's purse on a dresser and put it down the front of my shirt without even opening it. They found me sleeping under the back porch with the purse under my cheek like a pillow. The old man gave me a sound wailing for stealing, but all the while he was slapping me around, I had the conviction that I hadn't really done what I was being slapped around for. I felt that if Aunt were there, she would say I hadn't done anything wrong. I felt for the first time that everything was wrong, all wrong. I first began to believe about that time that Aunt was really my mother. It was a screwy kid sort of hope, and a hope that finally came true. I must have been about 12 when I learned that the old man had left her and married her younger sister. Don't ask me what he was thinking of, but that's what he did. When I was born and Aunt had no way of taking care of me, he and the younger sister took me in. I guess the old man figured that was the cheapest way out. He always figured the cheapest way, no matter how much it cost in the long run or who had to pay off. That's how it was that I grew up remembering my mother as, quote, aunt, unquote, and calling my aunt, quote, ma, unquote. And everything in remembering her was hooked up with the smell of her purse and the small coins of love it had carried. I didn't grow up thinking of pennies and nickels and dimes as such. I thought of them always without fully realizing it as love pennies, love nickels, and love dimes. When I saved them as a kid, I wasn't really saving money, because when I'd realized that money was all they came to, I'd break the bank and get rid of them at the nearest candy store as fast as I could spend. If the candy store was closed, I'd give them away. It wasn't always stealing, either. Once, when I was about nine, I was going down Division Street flipping a dime. It slipped through my fingers and rolled off the curb into the gutter. When I stopped to pick it up, I saw a quarter lying beside it. I looked to see if it had Aunt's picture on it. It was years before I really ceased to believe that the woman's head on a quarter wasn't hers. And for the next two weeks, all I did was walk down Division, flipping that lucky dime. I couldn't tell you yet whether I was looking for Ant or another quarter. But I didn't find either. I tried new sidewalks and strange streets. I got to know the whole near northwest side that way. And I lost the dime. And that, in a small way, was like losing Ant all over. But I began dreaming up other ways of finding quarters, you know. Toward spring, I decided that lots of kids must have lost money skating on the pond at Eckert Park during the winter. I went over there on the first day that the ice was melting and surveyed the slush inch by inch, although the soles of my shoes were paper thin. I found four pennies, three dice, and a tin of Prince Albert tobacco. The tin was rusted, but the tobacco tasted interesting. I was sick by evening and in a fever, confessed about chewing the tobacco. That's the only time I remember admitting doing something wrong without getting whipped. I was too sick to whip. But sick as I was, I didn't squeal about the four pennies. They were hidden. I was going to return them to Aunt, and I would have died before telling. I remember having a vague and feverish conviction that they were hers, because all the pennies and nickels in the world somehow really belonged to her. By evening, the doctor had to come. 
It wasn't the Prince Albert entirely. I'd caught cold from waiting in the slush, and it had gone into flu. That was the epidemic of 1917, I guess. Something has always happened to ruin my get-rich-quick schemes. Toward the end of that summer, I was coming home from a swimming pool in Little Italy, about a mile away, where kids could swim for a penny. I remember that my swimming suit was still wetter than my clothes, and that I took a shortcut across the northwestern tracks. There was a long board fence bounding the coal yard there in those years, and as I passed a place where a board was missing, a kid poked his head out and hissed, Hey, you, come here, as though he'd been expecting me. I'd never seen the kid before. He was about seven, I guess. He squatted down in the weeds and came up with a green bandana in which lay eight singles and some small change. That's your part, he tells me, and gives me half the bills and half the change. He'd taken it all out of a northwestern caboose, and he knew he was stealing it as well as I. That's why he called me, to share his guilt. Only, I didn't feel guilty. I'd already had my beating for stealing, so what I had in my hand had been well paid for. I felt as though somebody, maybe God, had owed me this for a long time, and it was only in the natural run of things that it should come my way at last. And as I stood there, the warmth of the coins that had been lined in summer sunlight spread from my palm to my whole body, for Aunt's war was in all coins. When I closed my fist over them, I was enclosing her hand, and in that moment they became so precious to me that my fingernails dug into the flesh as if I never wanted to open my hand again. Then I thought of the old man and flattened the bills and stuffed them into my rolled sleeves. I don't know where I got the idea to do that, but kids raised on crowded corners get cunning pretty early. I wandered around for kids, looking, I, looking for kids I knew and found a half a dozen ragged strays lagging beer corks on the corner of Ellen Street. With a prissy-looking, eleven-year-old blonde watching in solemn disapproval, I knew her. She lived next door and spent half her life, it seemed to me, on the alert for me to do something wrong in order to report it to the old man. If I spent a, a penny a mile away, she'd have learned of it, and I'd become entangled in such a web of lies, trying to duck another beating that I wouldn't know myself what the truth was. So I stood there with the most money I'd ever had in my life, and just as unable to buy something with it as though all the ice cream parlors had closed for keeps. My bathing suit began to itch. Kids are sly, all right. There wasn't any use waiting for her to leave. She'd find out anyhow. So when no one was looking, I dropped a dollar in the dirt and hollered, Oh boy, look what I found! The wagon stopped. Augie found a dollar! We were all here, and nobody seen it but Augie. Augie, the lucky eagle eye. So here we all go to the ice cream store, with the kids crowding around me and the prissy blonde following like a little Pinkerton. I bought two cones for myself first, and alternated at licking them, one chocolate and one vanilla. I didn't like strawberry even then. I don't think all the kids got cones, because there must have been at least 40 swarming into the store by that time. The blonde got one, though, a strawberry doubleheader. When the lacking was resumed and the excitement had subsided, I felt a crying need for more ice cream. It was getting towards supper time, but I hated going home, even to rid myself of the itching bathing suit. I felt a couple more cones would keep me going all hours. This time I played it safe. I only used half a dollar, which seemed then only half as wrong. Look, a heifer. Am I lucky today, you? Is he lucky today, you? Lucky Augie the Eagle Eye. And so back to the ice cream store. When I came out of the house the next morning, half a dozen kids were waiting for me. Kids I'd never seen before, from way over on Chicago Avenue. They didn't say anything, but they followed me so closely, it was impossible to lose a penny without being seen in the act. And, of course, the 24-hour Pinkerton, the eye that never slept, a little taller than any of the other kids, still shadowing me and still as grave as ever. The sprouts followed my very eyes. If I glanced toward a telephone pole, they would race there and search the alley for yards around. The blonde didn't search. She was het. She just watched my pockets and my hands. It didn't do her any good because I started lagging beer corks with the other kids until her interest wandered to other suspects on whom she was keeping book. And that evening, I earned 75 cents selling the Saturday evening blade on the corner of Milwaukee Avenue and Ashland. The same kids were waiting for me the next morning, and I spent every dime of the Saturday evening blade money on them before noon to maintain my far-flung reputation as an easy spender. 
Six bits in a single morning broke all local records for loose living. And you can guess the rest. As soon as she'd finished another strawberry double header, the Pinkerton raced a maw. Augie steals money every day, she told the old lady. A lot you got to holler, Susie, I, I told her. You helped me spend it. I know it wasn't a use saying I'd earned it selling the blade. It was a beating either way. Every time I was whipped unjustly, I became lonely for Aunt. And the next morning, I started out looking for her, to tell her how it was that nobody bothered you when you spent stolen money, except to help you spend it, but that the payoff came when you were caught spending money you'd earned honestly. I couldn't figure that out beyond feeling that my mistake had been going to work at all. If I'd gone searching around that broken board in the coal yard fence, it seemed to me, instead of fooling around with the blade, I might have done better. At least I wouldn't have been licked. I had no idea where she lived, and so just wandered around looking at houses and occasionally ringing a doorbell in some blind hope that that might be the place she lived. I knew better than to ask Ma where Aunt lived, because all Ma did when I mentioned Aunt was the ball. It got so late that I was afraid to go home without some excuse. I'd been up and down streets and alleys the whole morning and most of the afternoon, and now the red headlines of the Blade, which had been featuring kidnap stories, came to my mind. Toward dark, I stopped in an alley, found a piece of glass, and gave myself a long scratch down my right arm. The kidnappers had done that, I would tell Ma, when I was struggling to get away. That's one you'll have to figure out for yourself, but I don't think I really did it to pass myself off as a kidnapped kid. Nor entirely to get out of a beating, either. I think that, at bottom, I had the hope of getting sympathy out of the old man. It turned out to be the worst beating I'd ever had and I know I never tried for anyone's sympathy again. After that, I'm sure I was entirely on my own. After that, so far as myself and the old man were concerned, it was strictly warfare. But I still feel that if I could, somehow, have seen Aunt that day, things might have turned out different. I think she might have kept things from getting mixed up, at least until I was grown enough to figure them out for myself. But I didn't see her, and when things got mixed up that day, they stayed mixed up for keeps. We grew out of the beer cork stage into lagging for tin for a penny pictures of baseball players. Like the beer corks, some of these had a larger value than others. I remember trading an entire strip of tin to get just one of Joe Jackson. And a month later, when Jackson had been kicked out of organized baseball, I had to give one of him, one of Buck Weaver, and two Happy Felch just to get one Ray Schalk, who had been on the original strip I traded for Shoeless Joe in the first place. When we started lagging for pennies, we forgot about the baseball players, and nobody cared anymore whether Ray Schalk was a good guy or a bad guy anyhow. The feeling grew that he might have been a sucker. Who'd gotten the payroll? That's what we wanted to know now. We drifted into the crap games behind the Anderson School, and when the cops started breaking them up, the attraction became irresistible. Once a dozen of us spent an afternoon in the Racine Avenue station because the kid we'd set up as a lookout had wandered off to match nickels with the corner. Newsy. It was a hot afternoon, and her numbers gave us courage. We heckled the cops, and were really proud of being jailbirds. How did we kill the afternoon when the cops ignored us? You guessed it again. I lost 46 cents. When I got home, Sissy had already told my old man where I'd been, but the whipping was nothing at all compared to the sense of manhood attained by an afternoon in the clink. It was the most exciting thing that had ever happened to us. For days we bragged to each other about our various parts in the escapade, who was the most scared, who wasn't scared at all, and whose brother right now was doing 90 days and counting. For us, the kid whose brother was doing a stretch was as distinguished as a kid in another neighborhood whose brother was a college football star. This was all in the days when newspapers were a penny apiece, and we had a lot of dodges around the stands. When the racetrack and baseball fans handed you a nickel, they'd grab the sheet and stare at the results with one hand, held out blindly for their change. The dodge was to lay a penny in the waiting hand, click a second penny on the first and the third on the second, but the last penny you just clicked without dropping it. The fellow would shove the change in his pocket and never know he'd been gypped. Sometimes if a customer didn't have anything smaller than a nickel or a dime, we'd plead that we had no change and go into the nearest saloon to get it. Then we'd duck out the lady's interest, leaving the sucker waiting in front. When a streetcar was waiting for a red light, we'd run up alongside the car, and some guy would stick his hand out for a paper. 
If he offered a nickel or a dime, we'd fumble and dig for that change until the car started, and then run beside the car with the change, trying to reach the fellow's hand, but never somehow quite making it. That only failed me once. A guy got off at the next stop and came back for the change. Tin horn. Around Christmas, the big paper guys had cards printed and sold them to us little paper guys for a nickel apiece. The cards read, if I remember rightly, Christmas comes but once a year, and when it comes, it brings good cheer. So open your purse without a tear, and remember the newsboy standing here. Sometimes that one was good for as much as a quarter, but this was the payoff. We had to ask for the card back, because it cost us a nickel, and the customer would be thinking it was his that he'd bought it. We called the big paper guys the not whole wonders. I don't remember why. There were no stands in those days. The papers were just piled on the corners with stones on them, and every corner pile was run by some big guy. If a little guy sold a paper, it had to be in the middle of the block. But I remember selling a paper to a woman on the corner of Roby and Division, right under a big guy's nose. I never tried that again. I had to buy the paper back from the big guy, and I got a kick that was positively terrific. It lifted me off the ground and scattered my papers for yards. I didn't even take time to howl while gathering them up in the Russian noontime traffic. I was so afraid of losing those papers. But when I got home, it really began hurting, and I cried all night. And every time I saw the big paper guy for a year after, I would still feel that kick. Sometimes I can still feel it. And sometimes one of the big guys would make a deal with one of the little guys. He would say, hey, Sprout, you want to buy me out tonight? That meant buying him out around midnight when the final lull began at the wholesale price. I made a deal like that once, but along about 1 a.m. it turned bitterly cold, and I had more papers left than I could sell in a week of Saturday nights. I was stuck. So I started to ball, too cold to stand still, and too afraid to go home. I just wandered around, wiping my nose on my sleeve and bawling, making people pause to ask what the matter was. I sold out, bawling the whole time, and had enough tears left over to help one of the other kids get rid of his papers, too. I must have been nine or ten by that time. If there wasn't anything in the headlines to yell about, we just hollered, Big White House scandal! Big White House scandal! I thought the White House was the Derby Hotel where the big guys went to see the big girls. It had white doors and a long white marble desk. One afternoon when I was about thirteen, I delivered a couple papers up there to the third floor and saw a woman in a kimono come down the hall, whom I took for Aunt. I said, hello, Aunt, with such a hope of happiness in me I've never felt since. I don't think I'll ever come that close again. But she didn't answer, and she didn't look around, and I had to believe it wasn't her after all. But in later years I figured it this way. If it really hadn't been her, she would have turned when I called. She would have turned her head to see who'd called her. I figure now she was afraid to turn her head. I went up there a number of times after that under the pretense of delivering a paper and wandered the long, plush-carpeted hall listening to the laughter of women behind many doors, hoping always to hear Aunt's laughter. It was dark in the hallway. That was why she hadn't recognized me, I decided. It had been so long since I'd seen her. I'd grown so much taller. That was why she hadn't recognized me. I spent so much time up there that the desk man made me leave the papers at the desk. He thought I was up to something else. That's how it's always been. I was always in the clear so long as I was truly guilty, but the minute my motives were honest, someone would finger me. Another way we used to raise money was to go to the market and get these big empty barrels, not the casks, the barrels. The bigger guys could carry them, but we little guys rolled them. They rolled easy and the meat packers paid us a nickel each for them. We couldn't find enough of them naturally, so we'd steal them from one packer and sell them to another. I must have been out fourteen when I made sudden friends with a kid who had a nice home. I don't remember the kid, but I remember the home, which was clean and bright all day, and his mother, who was handsome, it was a third floor flat somewhere with lots of plants in the front room with sunlight on them. He had a puppy, and we used to play with it up there. It's the first memory I have of being happy, playing with that pup in that pleasant place. We must have been making a lot of noise because his kid's mother walked past and said jokingly to make us be a little quiet, why don't you kids just throw that dog out the window? I was so happy at just being there, so overwhelmed with an eagerness to please, that I picked up the pup, walked to the window, and threw it out just like that.
I can still see that poor damn pup sprawling and turning and pawing for a foothold in midair on its way down to the pavement and felt suddenly that I was falling too. I was falling all right. But I was 16 before I hit the ground. It happened the week after the old man told me that Aunt was dead, and I guess a kid still has a right to tears at that age, but I didn't shed one. I had some twisted idea that that would give the old man some sort of satisfaction. I just dummied up on him. He was so puzzled because I didn't bawl or even look like I felt bad that he followed me out of the room to tell me that she was really my mother. I knew that eight years ago, I told him straight. I knew she was my old lady the night you threw her out. But you were never my old man. Of course he was all right. I was just trying to make him feel like he was trying to make me feel. He started blowing up and told me to get out. I know he didn't mean it because I was bringing him the rent. If I left now, I told him, you'd have me locked up. I'll wait till I'm of age, then I'll see you in hell with your back broke. I'll be glad to get rid of you, he tells me. You're going to go bad. You might as well go down and get a good start. Oh, and you won't have me locked up for running away? Why should I, he asks. All you've been to me is trouble. Well, what do you think you've been to me, I asked him then. A father? A lot you got to holler. And I grabbed my cap and left. I took a room with little Johnny Polish over on Western Avenue. Johnny called himself a jukebox mechanic, and he had a car. We went around fixing jukes whenever we got in the shorts. We really fixed them, too, only sometimes we'd make a mistake and hit some juke we'd already fixed once. We did that once in a bookie of all places, a tavern with a bookie in the back. I thought it looked familiar, but Johnny didn't say anything, so we went right ahead. On the way out, the bartender, who knew Johnny, called him over and said something, looking a little white. When we got in the car, Johnny looked white, too, and I really wheeled out of there. They're getting tired of us in there, Johnny said after a while. That's a syndicate box. We didn't go near that joint again, and were more careful altogether. We operated out of the neighborhood until the syndicate cooled off. And sometimes we'd have so many dimes, nickels, and quarters up in the room that we wouldn't even bother to divide them. We got a scale and weighed them. I remember we figured 11 ounces to the dollar. The first time I took a fall, I was alone having coffee at a restaurant at Damon and Division. They sat down one on either side of me, and the first thing that popped into my head was that they were syndicate men dressed like coppers. Something like that had happened in the neighborhood before. They were real cops, though. I had to sweat it out at 11th and stayed overnight and stand the show up before I found out that all it was was the old man. He'd reneged on his word to me, just he had with Aunt. He'd given me out as a runway, and I had to put in 20 days of juvenile. All I remember that stretch is this. When we came in, we were given a copy of the rules, told to make the best of things, and that was all the interest any of us received there. The night I got out, I slugged a peanut machine, one of those L-platform jobs. It was in the dark at the far end of the platform, and all I went up to the thing was for me to get a handful of peanuts, but when I put my hand in the lever, I felt the warmth of the day still trapped in the metal, and the warmth of Aunt's hand pressing pennies into my hand. Before I knew what I was doing, I'd slugged the glass with my naked fist. It was absolutely crazy, and I don't understand it myself to this day. I cut the hell out of my hand, and the woman at the cashier's cage heard the tinkle of the glass. I would have been a lot smarter to have slugged her instead of the peanuts. That was the only time I used raw jaw methods. Rip and tear is all right for kids, but there's no future in it. Johnny Polish laughed his head off over that one when he came up to see me at County. Then he had the ward superintendent put in the fix, and all I got was 30 days. I was paroled to my old man. What a laugh. I've never figured out to myself why I pinned everything on the, the old man. Sometimes I think I started blaming him before I was born almost. It wasn't anything I tried figuring at all. It was just the way I felt. So deep down, that it was beyond all figuring. I used to wake up nights thinking of the night he'd given her the bum's rush when she didn't have a place to go, except perhaps the Derby Hotel. When I thought of that, I think I could have killed him as quick as stepping on a roach, and that easy. And yet by that time it wouldn't have done me any more good than stepping on a roach. When I came out of county, I had him where I could have stepped on him any time. Like it says in the song, I had him in the palm of my hand. All I did was lay around the house smoking cigarettes and playing the radio loud and never letting the old man tune into the Polish hour because that was the one program I knew which he understood and enjoyed. 
In fact, it was the only thing he enjoyed, and the one thing he'd bought the radio for. I'd turn on Spike Jones, and he'd sit in the kitchen and drink and take it out on Ma. That was their business, so long as they stayed in the kitchen. He wanted me home, he told the police, so now he had me there. He wasn't in much of a position to tell them he'd changed his mind. Some nights I'd have half the neighborhood in the front room. Little Johnny's bring up a couple of neighborhood tramps in the joint would really jump. One night, just to get his goat, we started a strip poker game. The old man lost his head and called the squad. Little Johnny asked them in, and they saw who was there beside the tramps. The ward super, two precinct captains, Little Johnny, a Jew mouthpiece we called Noseberg O'Brien, and a bailiff from the criminal court. They asked us to be a little quiet about it, and we slipped them a fin apiece, and they backed off. With all the writs and corpuses Noseberg O'Brien had in his hat, they were lucky to get out of there with their jobs coming into a private home without a warrant like that. After the party broke up, I told the old man, polite-like, in Polish, that if he ever did a thing like that again, they'd find him under the sink with his little toes turned up. Under the sink with the rest of the pipes. But letting a roach go don't make you like him any more the next time you see him come crawling. He begged me to leave then and promised he wouldn't have brought me back. What's the use, I said. You'd have me locked up all over again is all. This time I won't, he said. And that time I knew he meant it. He had a stomach full of little loggy by then. I stayed home that night, and when I was packing in the morning, he stuck his mug in the door and watched a while to see that I wasn't taking anything that belonged to him. You're going to die in jail, Loggy, he told me after a while, just to say something. You never cared where I lived, I told him, a lot you got to holler where I die. And I remembered how she had wanted to say goodbye to me one night in the same house, and he hadn't let her. I didn't even say so long. You write out of, well, I wouldn't call it indignation, but a kind of irritability that these people on top should be so contented, so absolutely unaware of these other people, and so sure that their values are the right ones. I mean, there's a certain satisfaction in recording the people underneath, whose values are as good as theirs, and a lot funnier, and a lot truer, in a way. Nelson Algren.